about to leave already packing come with me i'm not really asking we'll get away to a place where we don't know about to see the world in action what we can be life with no distractions we'll get away this is what we Good evening, everyone. It's Jim here. Welcome uh, to our second live revision session for... Uh, oh, hang on, I can hear myself. <laughs> That's because I've got my laptop <laughs> running left of me here, which is about three seconds behind. Let's start again. Uh, this is our second live stream uh, to help you get ready for Unit 3 tomorrow. And uh, last night we did personal finance, so tonight it must mean business finance. And we've got about 45, 50 minutes or so of quickfire revision activities including some formulae, some calculations. Can't cover the whole of the business finance uh, part of the specification, but we will cover a lot. Chances are there may be one or two things that you're not quite sure about that we cover tonight. No problems. You've still got time to um, to revise them. Uh, once this session is finished, it's recorded, by the way, I'll be, uh, once I get back home, I'll be on uh, on YouTube. If there's any questions that you want to ask, please post them into the comments. Uh, section of the recording, which goes live as soon as we finish the live session. But for now, welcome if you're joining us live. Uh, we've got almost uh, 600 people, 600 students joining us live and their teachers, of course, including the students and staff from Clevedon School, who I know have been working incredibly hard, getting ready for Unit 3. So all the best to you as well as everybody else. So we're going to cover a lot tonight, some MCQs. We've got a chili quiz or two to finish, some formulae and some calculation to have a go at, but also looking at some situations, applying our business finance knowledge uh, to, uh, to, to some situations, in, for example, in, in terms of sources of finance and that kind of stuff. The Marshy School are also here, so you get a shout out as well. I don't know whether, is Ben, is ben in the house tonight? Uh, last night I was accused of making Ben the teacher's pet by constantly putting his suggestions and answers on the screen. Um, so maybe I'll look out for him <laughs> and uh, do the same again tonight. So here we go. As always, uh, this is live. So please use the live chat for the intended purpose. Uh, we're here to help each other and also 
uh, revise as effectively as we can. Plenty of time before tomorrow. And, uh, well, why don't we make a start? Now that Trafford College are ready to go, let's make a start. OK, as always, we start with a few multiple choice questions. And as we go through, we'll take them nice and gently. We'll pick out any information that you're not sure about. Uh, for example, if we've got any questions from Selby College or Wickham, uh, they'll sure they'll post them into the live chat. Here's our first question. A business has spent £300,000 developing a patent or patent and wants to spread this cost over the life of the patent. What accounting adjustment will do that? So four accounting adjustments that we sometimes have to make in Unit 3. Is it depreciation? Is it accruals? Is it amortisation? Or is it prepayment? A, B, C or D? What do we think? And I'll keep an eye out on the live chat as we go through today, particularly when we get to sort of the give me twos and that kind of stuff. I'll try to put some of your answers on the on the screen. I'll say I won't be able to put them all on. What do we think? Most people going for A, depreciation. One or two going for B, a few going for C, one or two going for D. Let's have a look at the answer. The answer is, he says, <laughs> getting the right button. Oh, no, it's that it's that technology. Messing me up again. It's amortization. Now, here's an interesting thing. Amortization appeared uh, for the first time in Unit 3 in a question last June. It was just a two marker talking about what the effect of amortization might be on the financial statements. And a lot of students hadn't, hadn't come across the concept of amortization. So let's just spend a minute on that. Amortization. So don't worry if you've not heard of it before, I'll explain it. It's like depreciation, but depreciation is applied to reduce the value of tangible fixed assets, whereas amortization is an adjustment very similar to depreciation that we make to intangible fixed assets. For example, the cost of patents or the costs of trademarks, or perhaps if you buy a franchise and you and a, say you pay £20,000 to have the right to run a franchise, an intangible asset like goodwill, amortization just basically exactly the same as depreciation what happens is you reduce the value of that intangible asset over a period of time. So let's say, for example, the patent was worth, well, let's go back to that question. What was it? It was £300,000. Let's say that it's it's going to last, I don't know, 30 years. Yeah, that will be £10,000 amortization per year. So that's our first question. And hopefully that I might have listed a little term that you maybe not come across before. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> amortization. Uh, Selby College are up and running. Good stuff. Got that one right. Have a go at this one. So which one of the following would not be not be included in current liabilities in one of our favourite statements, isn't it? The statement of financial position. Now, by the way, these questions aren't easy at the start. We will get slightly easier, but I've deliberately tried to pick topics that sometimes uh, appear in the exam paper and think, oh, I've never heard of that or not quite sure about that. So we're trying to just to fine tune our revision here. I'll give you a clue. It's either A, B, C, or D. Always try to be helpful. Thank you. Uh, so what do we think? Which one of the following would not be included in current liabilities? Jack's going D, Peter, and uh, Bartolo, and Lucy, and David, and and, uh, and various others uh, are going for B. What do we think? A few more coming in. A little bit of, a little bit of uh, difference with these answers. Not quite everybody saying the same thing. Well, the only one that would not be included in current liabilities is prepayments. Why is that? Well, because prepayment is a current asset. It's a it's a value to the business. It's where we pay for things in advance, future benefits. Whereas all the other three there, short-term bank loan, it could be a bank overdraft, a trade payables, amounts that we owe to our suppliers, and accruals. That's where we make an adjustment to reflect the fact that we may owe somebody some money for a cost. Those are all current liabilities, whereas prepayments is not. It's a current asset. Now, we'll come back to prepayments and accruals and depreciation later in this session. So don't worry if you're not quite sure about those. Uh, we did a big poll of, of Unit 3 BTEC business teachers, and they said that prepayments and depreciation were right up there with things to revise in the last few hours. So no problem. Okay, now this is quite a hard question as well. So let's take our time on this. The table there shows some information taken from the statement of financial position. Now, from that information, can you tell me what the drawings were for the year? If you know what drawings were, you should be able to work it out. Let's spend a bit of time on that. 
So we've got some just an extract from the sort of the capital side of the statement of financial position. So the opening capital, 246,000. The profit for the year, 82. And we're told what the closing capital was, 310,000. So what was or what are or what were the drawings? So again, don't worry if you've not come across drawings before. I will explain them in a second. It is in the specification. And I just wanted to make sure we covered it in case it came up. Then at least you can say, oh, yeah, I remember that. We did that last night. So uh, Rian, Andrea, uh, Dane and Joseph all going for the same one. Emily as well going for D. So let's have a look and see whether you are right. And well done. It is indeed D, £18,000 worth of drawings. But looking at the live chat, I can see that one or two people not sure about that one. So why don't we just spend a few seconds explaining what drawings are. So drawings are what you take out of the business. Now, let's imagine, for example, I've got a business and I start the year with capital of £100,000. That's what I've put into it, plus my retained profits. Let's say I take out £25,000 for my own use. Take it out of the business, go spend it on whatever. A nice holiday. I need a holiday. That's what drawings is. Drawings is the owner of the business taking money out of the business, drawing it out to be used elsewhere. And that's why we need to know about drawings because it affects our capital employed. And there is, in fact, the little, little working for capital employed. There were, and just using the data there from the multiple choice question, our opening capital, that's what we started with. That's what we had left in the bit or invested in the business. We made some profit. So profit adds to what's in the business. And we were told what was left. That must have mean we've taken some out. £18,000 was what we took out. That were the drawings. OK, next question. Now, types of cost. And I've got a concept here, which is in the specification. But again, some students find it quite hard to uh, to pick out this concept. So why don't we have a look at this one? <laughs> so which one of the following costs, therefore just one of them, A, B, C or D, uh, of a pizza delivery business is likely to be semi variable in nature? So we know we've got different types of costs, haven't we? We've got variable costs fixed costs and semi-variable costs. One of those is the most likely to be semi-variable. And what I mean by that is there will be an element that is fixed and an element that is variable. That's why they call it semi-variable. So it's not completely variable. It's not completely fixed. What do we think? So again, this is the sort of fourth of our hard concepts tonight. So we've deliberately picked concepts which could come up. We don't know whether they will or not, but they can sometimes throw students. Semi-variable costs, an element that has a fixed bit, but also a variable bit. Well, lots of answers coming in. Most people, I would say, going for A, Lewis, uh, Samuel. Uh, who else is going for A? Tidings, Taron. A few people going for B. Well, the answer is A. So if you said A, or if you thought it was A, well done. Why is it operating the motorbikes? Well, if you imagine with a motorbike, you've got sort of different elements, haven't you? First of all, you're, you're sort of maybe um, leasing or renting the motorbikes. That's fixed, isn't it? Whether you use them or not, the cost is the same. And uh, maybe the um, the maintenance and repairs and insurance of the bikes, that's also fixed, isn't it? But also there's going to be a variable element, isn't it? Maybe the fuel, the fuel of uh, operating the motorbike. So there's definitely semi-variable. And the other three definitely aren't semi-variable, are they? So the cost of dough and toppings, well, that's going to be related to how many pizzas you sell. So that's variable. The payment per pizza for the delivery staff, that's variable. And the rent for the store, that's fixed. So the delivery motorbikes was semi-variable. OK, right. Now, maybe a little bit easier, this question. Now we're going to get a bit easier. So we're on to internal and external sources of finance. So one of those four, which one of those is an internal source of finance? What do we think? We'll come back to, yeah, actually, no, we're not going to go back over that. A, whether it's semi-variable or not. I think it is. I think there's a, a fixed cost of running a motorbike and there's also a variable cost like the fuel. Now, this looks better. Most people are going for what is perhaps the 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 simple and the obvious answer and that's good news the good news is it's also the correct answer retain profits i played the wrong sound effect then I don't, i've no idea what these buttons do there we go played the, played the wrong one again yeah it is retain profits um so yeah retain profits 
possibly the most important source of finance for any business, to be honest with you. If you can make profit, that is the best source of finance because it's it's cheap, it's free, and you can decide what to do with it. And that is an internal source of finance where the other three are external. Good stuff. Right. I should stop saying good stuff and excellent too much. I'm saying that too many times. I'll come up with some with some different words for this one. Now, I've got a definition on the screen here. Now, we were having this debate in the live chat just before we started. So those of you who were paying attention will know the answer to this. There is a definition, but what is it a definition of? A type of long-term debt where a business borrows money from investors and promises to pay them back with interest over a set period of time. Is that venture capital? Is it a bank loan? Is it mortgage? Or is it debenture? What do we think? If you are watching on the live chat, you will know the answer. Well, you may have been watching. You may not, you may not have. This is before we started, of course. A, B, C, or D. And again, this is one of those terms. If it came up, it could throw a lot of learners when they see it in the question. So it's just worth to, worth knowing that you you know what it is. Let's have a look at the answer. I would say most people have got that right. It is indeed a debenture. So a debenture is a form of loan, and it's and it's um, it's where basically a business offers the opportunity uh, for someone to loan money for it. So, uh, for example, let's say Tutor you issues a debenture to you lot. I could say, who'd like to loan me some money? Who'd like to take out a Tutor you bond, a Tutor you debenture, and I'll pay you 5% per year and I'll repay you in five years' time. And that's basically what a debenture is. It's where companies or businesses issue um, loans or take loans from investors in return for interest. So uh, that's what it is. It's a type of debt finance. Okay. Uh, looking at the live chat, most of it is still about unit three, which is good news. So why don't we move on to uh, giving you a little bit more to do now. So we've done some MCQs. We've warmed up. I've got two or three little scenarios here, which are typical unit three business finance scenarios. And what I want you to do is to sort of give me some ideas in the live chat as to what you think might be an appropriate answer. So here's our first one. We've got a business here. It wants to replace its delivery vans with new vehicles. Brand spanking new delivery vans. However, the business wants to minimize the cash outflows of doing this. So over to you, 30 seconds in the live chat. Give me at least one, but ideally two possible suitable sources of finance. It must have been luck, but the first comment I saw coming in the live chat was from Ben. So I put Ben's on first, followed by lots and lots of others coming up with two, I think, very suitable sources of finance for this particular situation. This is the key in unit three is apply the situation, always apply the situation. So uh, let's have a look at what we came up with, which actually were the two that you were most likely, most popular in terms of suggesting them. Uh, leasing and higher purchase. Now, let's just spend a minute just making sure we know what the difference is between the two. Uh, for example, you might get a question that asks you to consider the, the advantages of one or both, or perhaps you might have a choice. Maybe the business is, um, for one of the higher market qu high mark questions, the business maybe is looking at two different options, and you may be asked to decide or to, uh, to, to conclude which is the most appropriate. So it's worth knowing about the two of them. Uh, so, for example, leasing here, uh, and by the way, they're both basically similar in terms of cash flows, and they minimize the cash flows. But essentially, leasing, you don't own the vehicles. They're not yours. Yeah, You're just basically hiring them, really. But I'm not going to say the word hiring too often because it sounds like higher purchase. So leasing is, uh, you know, a leasing agreement. You get to use the vehicles. And the good news about that is uh, when the lease ends, you hand the vehicles back. And often the leasing company will pay for certain aspects like repairs and maintenance because they're their vehicles. 
higher purchase, similar from a cash flow point of view, but different in the sense that you have the option, if you wish to, to buy the vehicle. Well, the vehicle becomes yours at the end of the higher purchase agreement. So basically, it's like a loan where you're repaying the loan and at the end, and only at the end of it do the vehicles actually become yours. Yeah, so that's the difference. That's the essential difference between the two. Leasing, you don't own the vehicles. High purchase, you do once you've paid how many, the amount that you owe for them. Okay, excellent stuff. Right, that's a really good start. Why don't we look at another uh, Selby College, another shout out. I think that's the third, a third for this session. Here's a different situation here. Now we're talking about efficiency ratios here. So here's our situation. A business has very high trade receivables days or a very high trade receivables days ratio. Hopefully you know what that is. So over to you. Give me two ways in which it could improve cash flow by releasing that money tied up in trade receivables. Hmm. What do you think? Over, over to you. Good stuff. Now there's uh, lots of, uh, I said good stuff again, didn't I? I've got, to, I've got to come up with a new phrase for that. Ideas in the live chat, please, whilst I look at some of the answers coming through. I've stuck quite a few of them on the screen there. Now there aren't just two answers to this. There are a variety of different ways in which you can try to improve the situation if you have high trade receivables. I've got a couple to show you on screen, which I think I'll, I'll put up just because I, I want to explain the difference between the two. But lots of great answers coming in around you know, getting back to your customers and renegotiating the, the terms of, of, of their invoicing, trying to get them to pay pay quicker. One or two people in the live chat suggesting sending the boys around. Uh, that is one way of getting debtors to pay quicker and not necessarily the, the most effective way for maintaining good customer relations. But there are more than one way. For example, a lot of people have been suggesting trying to increase the, the, the volume and value of cash sales, maybe offering some discounts uh, to pay by cash. All very good answers and all relevant answers. I just wanted to put a couple on screen, which I know have been mentioned by quite a few people on the chat here, which is firstly debt factoring and secondly, invoice discounting. Now, both of these two are on the Unit 3 specification. And uh, I don't know whether you know the precise difference between the two, but just let me maybe spend a few seconds explaining what the difference is. Now, they both uh, are ways of quickly converting amounts that are owed to you by your customers. So we've got these trade receivables. Our customers are owing us money. We want the money. What do we turn to? Well, if we went to a debt factoring business, they would well take a look to decide whether they like us or not, uh, whether they like the look of those debts. But then if they decided to, they would give us the cash for those debts, and they would take on the responsibility of chasing the customers up and getting the money. Now, obviously, they don't give you everything. They probably knock off, I don't know, 15, 20% of what's owed to you because that's their return. So the debt factoring gives you the cash, but they take on the task of recovering the money. In other words, the debt, the trade receivables become theirs to collect. Invoice discounting is similar, but what happens is the invoice discounter, and it's usually a bank, they will give you a loan as uh, to, so the, the cash comes into the business and the security for the loan are the trade receivables. So if the trade receivables don't pay up, you've got a loan that you need to repay. So with invoice discounting, you still have to chase up the customers. That is the basic difference between those two. That's all you need to know about them. Yeah. But as I say, lots of great answers coming in in the live chat about uh, other ways of improving that high efficiency ratio there, the trade receivables. Okay, uh, I think hopefully that's useful. Why don't we move on uh, to, have we got one more of these? I'm just going to check on the screen here. Uh, let's see. We have one more, a slightly different situation here. So let's see if we can make it three out of three with some great responses. So a new business, there's the situation, a new business needs finance to invest in the development of innovative new products. 
So give me two sources of finance that might be appropriate for a new business trying to develop innovative products. Over to you. More good answers coming in. And uh, actually, I didn't have cryptocurrency as one of my suggested answers. And I suggest that uh, we don't use that as a, as a suggested answer tomorrow. Lots of people, though, uh, coming up with the two that I, uh, I had thought about when I wrote this question uh, earlier this morning, which is thinking about the situation. So, for example, we can't use retained profits, can we? Because it's a new business. And chances are we couldn't also use a bank loan because typically banks don't tend to loan to new businesses. They like to have some kind of track record. However, and a number of people have mentioned venture capital as being a source of, of finance for this, that's definitely a possibility. And then I've also put these other two uh, on the screen there, grants. So that's quite an interesting one. So there are a lot of grants out there. This is where an organisation like the government or maybe some kind of regional authority, maybe your local authority, has money to give you. It's a gift to the business if that money is used for a specific purpose. So there are lots of grants out there that are specifically designed to encourage new and existing businesses to develop, uh, for example, research and development, to, to launch new products, to, to perhaps help with their marketing, a whole host of things. So grants, there are no, no guarantee you'll get them, but it is a very effective source of finance if you're in the right sector. And lots of people mentioning uh, crowdfunding, including Kerry and who else? Uh, let's just scroll down. Lots of people going crowdfunding. Oh, so I've missed out one or two of the um, one or two of the later ones that are coming in there. Uh, crowdfunding, so uh, external source of finance. It can be cash. It can also be uh, commitments uh, to uh, to to buy products at uh, discounted prices. Maybe your first customers. Very popular. If you go onto things like uh, the various crowdfunding platforms, you'll often see new businesses uh, explaining what their new product idea is and trying to get some investment uh, from the crowdfunding investors. So those would be both very suitable sources of finance for that. Excellent. Right. I think we've uh, just about done with our little scenario. So the good news is now we're into doing a few calculations. And uh, it's your favorite. It's my favorite. It's the business finance formula spinner. So what we do, we'll do some calculations. But before we do that, we'll just remind ourselves of some of the main formulae that you need to remember. We have no idea what's coming up tomorrow. We don't know which calculations you might be asked to do or what data you might, might be able to apply a formula to. All you need to do is to be able to remember the formulae. So uh, why don't we spin the wheel? Now, what I've done is, and by the way, this is as much fun for you as it is for me. I have uh, randomly added six formulae to the to the wheel there. And all I'm going to do is spin the wheel and uh, it'll land on one of the six. And all you need to do in the live chat is to uh, tell me, if you wish, what the formulae or the formula is for the one it lands on. Let's spin the wheel. And it's landed on liquid capital ratio. So over to you. Maybe give yourself 15 seconds or so. What do we think is the formula for the liquid capital ratio? I'll see if I can spot who's first in the live chat. Oh, lots of people coming in. I'm not sure um, whether it was. Uh, there's too many coming in. There's too many coming in. Uh, Thomas, I think, was pretty quick. Izzy, uh, Izzy was very quick, but looking, looking, at, but may not have been first. Well done, we've got it. So don't forget the liquid capital ratio. I'll just put it on screen there. It's we just need to make an adjustment, don't we? It's current assets, but we don't include inventories. Now, just be careful with that. You might be given the current asset total and the inventory total, in which case you take inventories off. If you're given all the information in current assets, just ignore inventories. 
and then we divide that by current liabilities. Don't forget the liquid capital ratio is meant to be a more stringent test of liquidity. And the reason for that is that often businesses find it hard to turn inventories into cash quickly. Therefore, it's a, it's, it's a useful test of liquidity. Now, in, by magic, liquid capital ratio uh, should disappear and be replaced by a different formula. I can feel the excitement building. It's been re replaced by return on capital employed. Let's spin the wheel again. And whilst I do so, uh, Loughborough College are asking for a shout out. So it's my, my pleasure. And Loughborough College, over to you. What is the formula for markup? One of our profitability ratios. What is the formula for markup? I can tell from the live chat how much excitement is being generated by this uh, formula spinner. I must admit, I didn't anticipate it would be that po that popular. Looking on the uh, the live chat, I think uh, Thomas Thomas was first in with the correct formula, and then all of a sudden we get because we've got just short of a thousand people here, we get hundreds of people correctly correctly looking at it. Um, Christian's right, Jonah's right, uh, Rosella's right, Liam's right. You're all right. Well done for well done for typing it in. It's a good it's a good it's a good test of whether you know it. Yeah, for markup is the gross profit divided by cost of sales. That's how we calculate it. But don't forget, because it's a profitability percentage, we multiply by 100 to express it as a percentage. Now, we're going to have a look at markup in a second. So what does markup get replaced by? Markup has gone and current ratio has appeared. Let's spin the wheel again. This one is for Wilberforce College and uh, and others. Can you give me the formula for inventory turnover? Inventory turnover. I'm also expecting the, the team from Mid-Kent College to get this right as well, because I know you've been taught well and you know all your formulae. Uh, so no excuses for not telling me what the inventory turnover figure is. And I would say, oh, it's hard to say they're so fast. I would say it's going back. Who was first? Who was, it's hard to say. It could have been uh, high, high. I suspect it was Maddie who was first. Um, we'll look at inventory turnover in a minute. Somebody's asking what's inventory turnover. Uh, don't worry. Plenty of time before tomorrow. <laughs> inventory turnover. Well done. Yeah. So there it is. It's the average inventory. and They usually give you the average. You, you normally won't have to work out the average. They'll normally tell you what it is. Divided by the cost of sales. And because we want to express it in terms of uh, time, what we normally do is multiply it by 365 to give uh, an inventory turnover in the number of days. And what that means is the number of days on average of the value of inventory that we're holding in the business. Now, we'll see an example of that in a, in a couple of minutes. Inventory turnover should disappear. Let's see if it does. Margin of safety appears. Let's spin the wheel. I didn't realize just how popular this uh, this activity would be. If I'd have known, I'd have, I'd have done another two hours of this. And it's landed on your favorite ratio, my favorite ratio, return on capital employed. So again, over to you. Let's see who goes first on this one. Some of you would have been anticipating that it was going to land on that and getting ready to, uh, to type it into the live chat. Uh, <laughs> Jonah possibly first Ruby Brad literally arriving at the same second but the most important thing is you've all got it right yeah the return on capital employed it's quite an interesting ratio isn't it what's that no ratio is interesting is that what you're saying I think it's quite interesting yeah, it's profit divided by capital employed it's the return you make that's the profit sometimes you can use operating profit sometimes it's profit for the year, it doesn't really matter. Whatever profit you get given, divided by that capital employed, how much is invested in the business? And we always express return on capital employed as a percentage, net profit, profit for the year. Okay, have we got one more? We have. The fun never ends. Uh, so, oh, break even output has appeared in terms of return on capital employed. This might be the last one. I think we're running out of uh, running out of formula, aren't we? This one is for St John's sixth form. And others to have a go at the margin of safety. I thought it was going to land on gross profit margin, which is easy, but it didn't. It just tripped over to margin of safety. Uh, so I'm expecting uh, you to get that right, along with everybody from St. Brendan's College. Margin of safety. Katie, like, well, Katie from last night was on fire and 
definitely first in there. Diana, correct. Rosella is correct. Emily, Lucy, Dan, Maliki, and everybody else is correct. Everyone remembers the margin of safety. Interesting, the margin of safety is a very common calculation. Uh, unit three, a real examiner favorite. I was just analyzing every question from the last eight papers last night. And it's amazing how often margin of safety gets examined. So, and we'll see this in a second, actual output, less break even output. So how many are we actually making or selling? Take away our break even output. And always don't forget margin of safety, always expressed in units, as Charlotte has just uh, put into the live chat. Right, so why don't we put these formula into action? Now, we're not going to spend all night doing some calculations, but just sort of five minutes or so, some practice calculations. Don't forget the key with calculations tomorrow is to break them down. Always write the formula down, then substitute the numbers into the formula, and then show, show the answer. The reason for doing that is it helps you get it right, but also for whatever reason you make a small mistake with your calculator, you'll still get marks for showing the formula and you'll still get marks for the process. So don't just write the answer down, go through that stage, those steps, write the formula down, put the answers in, see which numbers you're missing, right, and then display your answer in the right units. That way you can maximize every mark that's going. Now our case study for the next five, 10 minutes is a business called Beanies For You. And Beanies Few is a small business, but they make customized beanie hats for some of the world's leading brands. And I and I know they do. I know they do because they make them for us. Look at that. Due to you, can you can you believe it? Just launched today, by the way. Twenty one different colors available. That was product placement at its best. I need to tell YouTube about that now. Anyway. Whilst you think, where can I get hold of a TTD beanie hat? Let's do some calculations. We've got uh, three of these, or three little parts of them, and our first one is all about break even. So, uh, <laughs> plugging his business. Well, I'm a small business, I've got to plug my products. So there we are, we've got some information on the screen there. Selling price per hat, cost of knitting the hat, cost of embroidery per hat. So those sound like variable costs. Fixed cost for the year, £15,000. And we're also told the business has sold 14,200 hats in the last 12 months. So over to you now. You can either have a go at one or either or, or one or both of these two. I'll give you a minute. Don't forget, we will work through these answers together. So don't worry about it. Either calculate the break-even output in hats or the margin of safety in hats or both. Over to you. There we go, a minute. So let's see how much you can get done in a minute. And uh, lots of correct answers coming into the live chat. Don't forget, well, we're dealing with break-even. We need to include the units. Uh, but lots of people have correctly identified that the break-even output is 10,000 hats. Uh, so let's just go through why that is. Well, don't forget the, the, uh, the break-even output formula is fixed costs divided by contribution per unit. So we're told the fixed costs, but we need to work out that contribution per unit. Well, contribution per unit is the selling price per unit, £5.75, less the total variable cost per unit. Well, we've got a couple of variable costs there, haven't we? The, the knitting and the embroidery. It's quite expensive, that embroidery per hat, £2.40. Uh, so the variable cost there is what's £4.25 per hat, isn't it? So therefore, the contribution per hat one pound fifty and if we divide 
uh, £15,000 fixed cost by £1.50, 10,000 hats. There you go. At the margin of safety, again, lots of people correctly identified, including all the students from Yule Castle, uh, that the margin of safety is the difference between actual output, 14,200 hats, and our break-even output, 10,000 hats, so the difference is 4,200. Now, if you've got a question like that, that could easily be a two-part question there for Unit 3. Show your workings, write the formula down like I've done there. And don't forget, with break-even questions, always include units. You could just put units if you wish. I've put hats. So don't, don't put £4,200 or £10,000 because that's not the right answer, is it? Break even all in units. Don't forget, this is all recorded. So if you want to go through this again, it's recorded and the recording is available the second I press end on the live stream. Now, let's move on to learn a bit more about beanies for you. By the way, I've posted the link to the uh, to the Tutor Do Beanies, uh, pinned it to the live chat. Um, so sales revenue for the year, £81,650. Cost of sales, £60,350. And we're also told average inventory during the year. Now, three more ratios you can choose to calculate here. Up to you to decide which one. But we have actually mentioned the formula for two of them, markup and inventory turnover. And so just to remind you, the, the formula for gross profit margin is gross profit divided by sales revenue expressed as a percentage. So over to you. I'll give you another minute. Maybe have a go at one or two, or even if you're super quick, all three. Have a go. Don't forget, gross profit is sales revenue, less cost of sales. Okay, so, uh, well, looking at the live stream, lots of correct answers coming in. Now, actually, I said on the screen there, calculate to one decimal place. Some people are, are doing that. Some people are rounding it up. Uh, I think if um, if it doesn't say it in the exam paper, I would just I would just show your workings and show whatever answer you want. But I would typically show if If it wasn't a round number, I would typically show it to one decimal place. But as long as you show your workings, that's the main thing. Just look out for that, though. Anyway, so uh, Ben, and not wanting to uh, not wanting to always put Ben's answers on the screen, but it's just appeared with his workings. Let's see whether Ben got it right, shall we? I don't know whether he did or he didn't. It's in 26.1, 35.3, 51.4 days. Let's have a look. I'm assuming it's the same Ben <laughs> as we had last night. Wait a minute. We've already done the music, haven't we? It's playing the music again. Didn't turn that one down. So there's our gross profit margin. 26.1%. Uh, so well done. Uh, Habib, suggesting that Ben stole the answers. Don't think he did. Uh, if I know Ben. So the gross profit margin, don't forget we need to work out gross profit. That's sales revenue, less cost of sales. So £21,300. We express that as a percentage of sales revenue. Always multiply by 100 and show as a percentage. So 26.1%. The markup, I think I've got this right. This is the gross profit divided by cost of sales multiplied uh, by 100. I think that's 35.3%. So that was our markup percentage. And uh, don't forget, markup is slight, it should always be slightly more shouldn't it, than the gross profit margin. That tells you how much on top of our cost of sales we have managed to, uh, to extract from the customer. Lastly, inventory turnover, it is indeed 51.4 days. So we take the average inventory of 8,500, divide it by cost of sales, 60,350, and multiply it by 365. Now, don't forget inventory turnover, where we're multiplying by 365, we, um, we express that in days. So don't just put 51. It's 51 what? It's not 51%, 51 units. It's 51 days, isn't it? That means every 51.4 days, 
we've basically used up our inventory. That's the idea of inventory turnover. So as Millie's pointed out in the live chat, it is important to put days at the end of inventory turnover. Avoiding the uh, the, the accusations that Ben is my uh, long forgotten son or I should be making him president of Tutor to you. Why don't we move on to the last little bit of calculation here? And we're going to do some accounting adjustments and we're going to do a little bit of uh, prepayments and depreciation. So Beanies for you rents its premises at £2,500 per year. Three months of this has just been paid. However, that payment actually relates to the next financial year. So over to you. What is the prepayment for rent that we would need to adjust our accounts for in terms of the two financial statements? So we're going to make a prepayment here. So calculate it, but also tell me where would that appear? How would that affect those two financial statements? Hopefully there's some music coming up. Here we go. Mostly Parks is formed, doing some great work in the live chat and lots of correct answers coming in. But one or two people saying I'm not quite sure about prepayments. So let's spend a few seconds on this one. Prepayments and accruals are two of our adjustments. Depreciation is the other. We're going to look at depreciation in a second. And, um, well, I know Ben got it right because uh, he spends all day revising. But lots of others also correctly identify that the prepayment we need here is £625. That should have a pound sign in front of it, shouldn't it? My error. Uh, so, and the reason for that is because we've prepaid a quarter, three months of next next year's rent. So that's not for this year, is it? That's a payment we've made, but actually the value for that rent occurs next year. And that's what we mean by prepayment. It's things that you prepay, but actually we want that cost to be in next year's accounts, not this year's. So we just need to adjust the accounts to make sure that the cost is in the right period. And the way we do that is by making in the statement of financial position, we add that 625 to a prepayment, a current asset, that's got some value for us. And also we would, in our statement of comprehensive income, where we show our income and costs, we would lower the rent cost by 625 to make sure that we've not double counted our rent. That's the idea of prepayments. Now, a number of people in the live chat just before we started saying, could we spend a few minutes having a look at depreciation? We certainly can. And uh, well, this, this will be our last calculation. Now, beanies for you, uh, perhaps because they see a lot of demand for Tuesday beanie hats about to hit them in the coming weeks or coming hours. Who knows? They've just bought a new embroidery machine to make to embroider hats. And they spent £25,000 on it. It's a big hat. Maybe they want to reduce that high embroidery cost per hat. Hopefully that will help improve their profit. Never mind that. They've spent £25,000 on this new machine. They think it will last eight years uh, before it will need replacing. So no residual value. That's it. Once eight years are up, that's it. So now don't forget there are two ways of calculating depreciation. One is called the straight line method over eight years. And also, if you want to have a go at it, but don't worry, I will go through how it works. There is another method called the reducing balance method. And if you want to have a go at that, use 20% per year. What I need from you guys and ladies is the, the depreciation cost for the first two years, for the first two years. So a little bit of calculation to be done here. I know one or two of you have already started. So let's start the clock. And don't, don't worry, we will go through how we calculate both these two. Thank you. 
So there's no residual cost, no residual value for this machine. So straight line, ignore residual value. Number of people asking in the live chat, what shall I do if I don't know any of the formulae? Well, hopefully uh, in, the, in the coming hours, maybe in the, in the morning, try to remember the main ones, things like the uh, those ratios, the profit margin ratios, the, the market percentage, and just try to, try to try to put them into your short-term memory would be my answer. But of course, the, the key to remembering formulae is to keep working on practice questions and understanding what they're trying to do. And then eventually, eventually they become second nature depreciation i think is possibly the hardest uh, adjustment to make and it it could be a calculation it could be an adjustment to the accounts it could also be a question that says uh you know which would be the best method to use straight line or reducing balance or maybe talk about the advantages or disadvantages of one or other of the methods so it could be examined in different ways anyway over to over to the answers well the easier one to calculate is straight line. And what we mean by that is, and that's one of the advantages of straight line, it's easy to calculate. We simply take the cost, £25,000, and we depreciate it over the life of the asset. So in, this, in other words, it's eight years. So every year we reduce the value of the assets by £3,125. And that's our cost each year. Well, two years worth of that is £6,250 or £3,125 per year, two years of it. So that's the idea. The idea of depreciation is the reduction in the value, the book value of a fixed asset like machinery, because the machine's going to wear out. So what you have to reflect the fact that that asset is going to fall in value. So a straight line is relatively easy, but that's with all of these things, put the formula down, put the numbers in. And even if you make a slight error, you'll still get some credit for any calculations. Now, the reducing balance is a slightly harder calculation. You start with £25,000 again. However, each year you apply the percentage to what's left. Now, at, at the start of year one, what's left is £25,000, isn't it? Because that's what we started with. So we reduce that by 20%. In other words, our depreciation cost in year one is £5,000. However, the fact that we've now got rid of £5,000 means that at the start of year two, we've only got an asset that is worth £20,000. So we apply our 20% to £20,000. So our depreciation is going to be less, isn't it? 20% is £4,000. So in other words, our total cost over two years is £9,000. There we go. <laughs> that is how you do reducing balance. So again, it, the session's recorded. If you get a chance and you ought to go through those two adjustments again, please do watch when we're finished. We've got about five or ten minutes left. We said we'd try and aim for an hour on this session, I would say we are bang on, I would say. Um, a shout out, because there's been a super chat in, and we don't get many super chats, do we, on Tuesday to do, for Mrs. Henry. Hang on, hang on. Wait a minute, I need to go back up here. Mrs. Henry and Mrs. Hill for a super chat. Mrs. Henry and Mrs. Hill. I mean, what can I say? You've, you've taught them so well. Anyway, the hardest is yet to come. It's this question coming up. We have two chili quizzes to finish off with. So three or four minutes on each. And I've deliberately tried to pick a couple of areas in the specification that haven't been examined very often or not every time, but sometimes students think, oh, I wish I'd just revised that in the, in, the, in the night before. So starting with this one. Now, you know the idea of the chili quiz. I'll give you three questions, I'll give you a minute to come up with one or more answers, but you can choose. You can either go mild, an easy question, spicy, a harder question, or if you're feeling up to it, and that includes Ben, then... Um, Go for the hot question, which is uh, worth three marks. So, But you can have a go all three if you wish. All I ask you in the live chat is just put the number or either type mild, spicy or hot so I can see what answers come up. Here's our first one. Um, there's our first question. Either give me two items that appear in a cash flow forecast, give me two benefits of completing a cash flow forecast, or the hot question, why might a cash flow forecast prove inaccurate? Over to you.
Yeah, uh, loads and loads of answers coming in. I'll just stick Joseph's on the screen there because Joseph's had a go at uh, each of the three elements there, which is pretty impressive within a minute, but lots of others have had a go as well. Joseph's pointed out uh, items in a cash flow forecast, total outflows, opening balance. Don't forget, we've got different lines, haven't we, in a cash flow forecast, so those two would definitely appear. Benefits of completing a cash flow forecast, the ability to help you plan your expenditure, and most importantly, perhaps, predict cash flow issues. Superb. And why might it prove inaccurate? Well, in particular, most businesses are over-optimistic when it comes to predicting sales and not cautious enough when it comes to predicting costs. So great answer to get all three of those. Let's see what I came up with, but I'm sure no better than what's been coming into the live chat. So the different lines aren't there on the cash flow forecast. You might be asked to complete one. So it's basically, basically getting a mark for each item. Sometimes it's adding things up. Sometimes it's working out a missing number. Uh, so uh, hopefully that's straightforward. The benefits of cash flow forecasting are quite important and every business should really do it, but particularly businesses where cash is 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 difficult. Maybe they are they don't have enough cash, maybe they have a bank overdraft. Really important to see what the you know what the uh, the peaks and the troughs are, see where the issues are, see whether you might be able to change the timing of maybe a cash payment or can you find a way of bringing some cash in because you need it. It's a very important discipline. And um, as lots of people said in the live chat, it's a forecast. I think a lot, quite a few people said, well, you know, it's a forecast. Therefore, you may fail to consider a whole variety of uh, different factors, such as um, cash outflows or payments, costs that you didn't anticipate. Or maybe you were overly optimistic about how much you might sell and at what profit. And therefore, your inflows aren't as strong as they could be. So great answers coming in. So thanks for those. I like Jake's point there that the cash flow forecast is a prediction. It is, isn't it? It's a point in time you say, we're going to look into our crystal ball and try and predict the future. Now, it could be your business is really easy to predict, but most businesses aren't like that, which is why cash flow forecasting is just a prediction. We've got one more, one more chili quiz, and uh, we're back to uh, financial ratios, but a variety of them here. So the the mild question is, give me a way in which a business could increase its margin of safety. I've mentioned already that margin of safety is an examiner favorite, so we want to be ready for that in the morning. Spicy question for two marks, how could you improve the return on capital employed? Do you remember the formula we did earlier? Lastly, three marks for tell me how the statement of financial position, the soft, helps assess the performance of a business. What does it tell you that you might find useful? Over to you. Wow, loads of great answers coming in again. Uh, loving these. Um, let's. Uh, I'll go through. I'm pretty sure what I've got on the screen is very similar to what's coming in the live chat as well. The other thing I just want to mention is, can I just say thank you? We've, I think yesterday was the first time ever we ever had any uh, super chats from people, and they are we are very grateful. That is that's very generous of you to uh, to give us a nice donation for these live streams. I do appreciate that. Uh, for example, Chris and others, David, uh, Bartholo, Andre. Uh, well, that's fantastic. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm quite, I'm quite taken aback by that, by uh, your generosity and your kindness about the session. Uh, let me just quickly go back to all these hundreds of answers coming through here on this, uh, on this, on this last activity. Just give me a second here. I'm on my own. <laughs> so here's what I went with and, um, mild. Well, I thought this was relatively easy. And if you think about the margin of safety, it's actual output, less break-even output. Well, what do you want to do? Well, ideally you sell more, don't you? That increases the actual output. 
However, the easiest way to improve uh, margin of safety is to lower your break-even output. And what's the easiest way of doing that? That's just lower your fixed costs. So you don't have to sell as many things. So can you cut some fixed costs, perhaps make a saving on some overheads like, I don't know, rent or whatever? That's the best way. It's the quick way to increase your margin of safety. Uh, how can a business increase its return on capital employed? Well, don't forget our formula. It's profit on the top, underneath capital employed. So if we can improve our profit, how might we do that? Perhaps by selling more, our more gross profit, perhaps by cutting our fixed costs, perhaps by increasing our contribution per unit, maybe by getting in, uh, reducing the variable cost per unit. What about uh, beanies for you? If that embroidery machine can maybe shave a pound off the cost of embroidering hats, that's an extra pound per unit. That's an extra 10,400 pounds, isn't it, of contribution? if they continue to sell 10,400 beanie hats a year, hopefully many more than that. Another way, though, this is quite an interesting one for you to think about, to, re to improve the return on capital employed is to have less capital employed. Now, it links back to what we said earlier. One way of having less capital employed as, a, as maybe the owner of a small business is to take some money out of the business. So if I've got, I don't know, a profit of £10,000 and I've got capital employed of £100,000, my return on capital employed is... 10%. But if I took £50,000 out, leaving £50,000 in there, and I go spend it on something that I want to spend it on, then that means my profit might still be 10 divided by 50. In other words, 20%. And that would have improved my return on capital employed. And the last one there, how do we improve? Or sorry, what does the statement of financial position tell us? The key thing here is just remember, it's just a snapshot of the assets and the liabilities that the business has. It tells us about the liquidity of the business. So our liquid capital ratio, we use that information. It tells us about the current ratio and it tells us about our efficiency, our efficiency ratios, trade payables days, trade receivables days and inventory turnover. So it's useful in that respect, but it doesn't tell us whether the business is profitable or doesn't tell us about how profitable the business is. So uh, Olivia, you're very kind. Thank you very much for that super chat. Spend all night thanking for thanking people for the super chats. So there we go. Hopefully that is useful in terms of a bit of an overview there of some of those, some of those, um, some of those ratios. I think I am almost done. I have got literally a minute left. So let's go back to. Uh, let's not go back to there. Let's go back to here. Well, what to say? Uh, we're getting some requests for shout outs, including, for example, Miss Martin, who apparently is the best business best business teacher ever. I can't I can't deny that's the, <laughs> that's the case. Um, what to say about tomorrow? We've still got a bit of time if you want to go over some of the things that we've covered in this session. So please do. As soon as we end this session in a minute's time, it will be available as a replay. And hopefully there's been some things that maybe highlight some topics that you just want to quickly go back over. Maybe look at some of those formally again. Don't forget last night we also spent an hour looking at personal finance. So it may be that you just want to spend a few minutes looking at bits of that. But the most important thing now is to get some rest and recharge your batteries and go into unit three, trying to grab every single one of those 80 marks that are going. It's two hours for the paper, so 80 marks, lots of time, some calculations, some short questions. And the main thing is fight for every mark. Don't leave a question unanswered. If it's a calculation, put your formulas down, apply the numbers to the formulae, and hopefully you've got the right answer, but you're still earning marks just by writing the formula down and having a go at the process. Give yourself the best chance by getting some rest. Help each other before you go into the exam. Encourage each other. And fingers crossed, it'll all go well for you. Let me know in the comments box on the video once the exam is finished how you think it went. And as I say, I'll be available in about half an hour. If there's any specific questions on what we've covered in this one hour together, I'll do my best to answer them or point you to where you might be able to find the answer. So if you're doing a bit more revision tonight, uh, please use the video for that. Anyway, for now, and a big thank you to everyone who's who's participated tonight and for all the lovely comments. I do appreciate that. All the best, and uh, we'll be thinking of you when you take your Unit 3. See ya.